Okay, I think we can um, go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Gira Papa. I'm an assistant professor at NYU School of Medicine. And on behalf of my co-organizers, Jessica Polka and Jesus Torres Vasquez, I would like to warmly welcome you to this event where we'll be focusing on journal independent peer review via Review Commons. Um, today we had uh, more than 300 participants registered and you represent uh, trainees, staff, faculty, editors, educators, and others involved in the life sciences community from all over the world. As we know, um, the way in which we communicate science and publish papers is evolving, and I think it's necessary and wonderful to gather a group um, of diverse people to really discuss different opinions and ideas. And I also really love that this uh, virtual format allows us to just break down the barriers between institutions, locations, and positions that we all hold in the community in order to do this. So before we get started, I'm just going to go through some uh, logistics of this event. Um, okay, so we really want this to be an interactive event. Uh, please use the Q&A feature that you'll find at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask questions and feel free to pop in a question at any time. Um, thank you to those of you who already submitted questions with your registration and we'll address those. If you would like to address your question to a specific panelist, please note that. And the way it'll work is that uh, Jesus, our moderator, will call out your question um, and it will be answered. So uh, when you go into the Q&A panel, you'll also see a like button there, which will allow you to upvote questions. And so if you see a question that you would also like to know the answer to, please go ahead and click the like button. That'll um, help us to sort the questions by popularity and we'll address them uh, in the order that people are most interested to hear the answers. This webinar is also being recorded. And so you do have the option to be anonymous. And if you would like to be anonymous, your voice and name will not appear on the recording. And so to do this, just click the uh, send anonymously button when you ask a question. Uh, we have a lot of people here and we're really happy to have, we'll have a lot of uh, different opinions. And we ask that you're, during the question and discussion, everyone to please make an effort to be professional and courteous. Please also don't discuss uh, confidential details about manuscripts you're reviewing and so on. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Jessica, who's going to moderate for us. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, as I will share that uh, slide once again, uh, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the agenda for today. So, uh, what I hope you can now see is that uh, first we're going to be hearing from Ron Vale and Maria Lepton, who will tell us about the motivation for Review Commons. And next, Sarah Monaco, who is the managing editor for Review Commons, will uh, discuss sort of how uh, how it's working and Tomas Lundberger will talk about evaluating review commons. Um, uh, I should mention that Ron Vale and Maria Lepton are uh, uh, sort of the founders of this project with Ron uh, serving um, at Genalia and Maria Lepton as director of EMBO. And following that we're going to have a panel to hear from author, reviewer, and affiliate editor perspectives. Um, so we're going to hear, uh, uh, Jira will give us the uh, uh, perspective of an author. Maureen Murphy will provide the perspective of an affiliate editor. She's at the Listar Institute and also eLife. And Rita Tiwari from University of Nottingham will provide the reviewer perspective. And following this, uh, Jesus will moderate a uh, discussion stimulated by the questions that you submit. So without further ado, I will invite Ron to tell us a bit about the motivation for Review Commons. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Um, I'm just going to, and welcome everyone. I'm just going to share my screen right now. Um, anyway, I do want to thank everyone um, who is really taking their time to participate and is obviously interested in the future of uh, the publication system. So uh, Review Commons really began um, as a thought that emerged at this uh, 2018 meeting, uh, which was uh, held at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, it was organized by 
uh, ASAP Bio, uh, where Jessica is the executive director, HHMI, and the Wellcome Trust. And it was a gathering of um, scientists and funders and journals and um, uh, other parts of administration of university systems. And we all came together to really talk about peer review uh, and how to make uh, peer review constructive, transparent, and efficient. And I, th I think we all believe that peer review is really uh, uh, necessary and an important foundation of the publishing system, but uh, it also has some problems that we're all aware of. Uh, you know, currently, and I would say increasingly so over the past uh, couple decades, um, scientists are finding themselves submitting to multiple journals and, uh, you know, all of these rounds of submissions to journals take enormous amount of our, our time. They involve multiple rounds of peer reviewers who have to review these and, um, uh, and so it, it basically ends up being very wasteful of, sign, of resources of scientists, and it also delays uh, the time of publication. Um, and, you know, there have been some estimates of uh, how much time has been devoted to uh, duplicating peer review efforts. And uh, whether this is the precise time or not doesn't matter. I think we all know that it's a very large number. So, uh, you know, this, this just has to change if we're going to make peer review a sustainable and viable part of the uh, publication enterprise, um, or we're going to hit, you know, a, a crisis of actually trying to get our scientific community to participate in peer review. And one of the things that Review Commons is seeking to do is to eliminate uh, this duplicative peer review. Uh, but in addition to being wasteful, I think it's also the quality of peer review that's important and, and the notion that peer review is a public good. So I think the way peer review exists is to improve science. And to do that, we really need to focus on the science and, and peer review the science and not just act as advisors for journals. Um, I think we've all had experiences where most of the reviews that have been returned have been focusing on uh, solely the appropriateness of a particular paper for a particular journal and ignored a lot of the constructive uh, uh, evaluation of the science itself. And this is something that has to change. And he here's even a quote from Vivian Siegel, who's an uh, editor for many journals. But she said, when a journal is new, peer review takes on a new quality. Reviewers would write, I don't know how to advise you because I don't know what the standards are, what, you're, what you want in your journal. So I guess I'll just tell you the strengths and weaknesses of a paper and then have you decide. Um, and the authors remark that the reviews, these reviews were unusually constructive, uh, whether we choose to accept the paper or not. So, um, you know, the review, peer review is an experiment to, you know, review for the author, review for science and not a particular journal. And the last thing that uh, I think we're trying to do here is recognizing the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the, the peer reviewing uh, occurs, but is lost. It's, it's lost from the scholarly record completely. And this is something much broader than Review Commons, but it's also something that Review Commons is trying to encourage is uh, transparent peer review and the concept of referee preprints that you'll hear about later. So with that, I'll, I'll pass you on to Maria and, and she'll kind of give you a little bit more of the history of the project and how we got to where we are. Oh, you're muted. Maria, you're muted. Mm. Uh, right, I'll start from scratch. Sorry about that. Right. Um, thank you, Ron, for, the, for, for, for getting us this far. And thank you, Gira and, and Jessica, for organizing it. Really fantastic. And I'm so pleased that there's so much interest. Um, we certainly are interested in this project, so it's good that that interest seems to be shared. 
as Ron said, this started at ASAP Bio, which was an amazing meeting because it was the first time scientists, funders, and a lot of people uh, got together and loudly voiced uh, uh, many of the concerns we had. The one tangible outcome from that meeting immediately was something we should not underestimate um, and which became a fantastic achievement, namely the uh, role that BioArchive plays now. That really came out of that meeting. Uh, people agreed there and then that uh, more posting should be done. Journals agreed there and then that uh, public posting of manuscripts prior to publication uh, would not uh, pre, uh, prejudge the way the journals, most journals at the time, certain journals didn't agree, took them a long time grudgingly to accept this. But anyway, so that was a first huge achievement and we were actually very happy with it. But the the irk that some things were still not working and still not being addressed, namely peer review, um, was still there and there, it didn't seem possible to find a consensus. So one day when I was at, at UCSF giving a talk, um, I, uh, you know, I obviously went to see uh, Ron as well. And I said, I'm so tired, let's just talk about science. And Ron said, yes, let's talk about science. He just got some really exciting new data and we started on that. And then either he or she said, but you know, it really still irks me. And Ron said, yeah, it really still irks me to look, couldn't we try this, couldn't we try that? And so we thought about how we could reintroduce the idea of having this journal agnostic review, a review that was quick and that made the resulting reviews portable. And I mean, again, the science was shortchanged, but what's come out is this here. So we did come up with an idea at the time, and I think I still either have the photograph of your whiteboard in your office, Ron, um, or, the, or the drawings we made later here. Uh, it was not easy because you have to find a consensus. And of course, the idea of a portable peer review is the better, the more journals you had to, uh, to join. And I know that some of the uh, uh, questions that have been written in uh, concern that issue. So we'll have an opportunity to talk about that later. Um, we decided then initially to talk to journals we knew were in some way like-minded. So all the participants at the moment, all our partner journals, our, our affiliates, are all people who um, are all journals who were prepared to take on some of the conditions that are necessary, i.e. ultimately to uh, to publish the reviews, um, to, do, to be engaged in, in, in um, open peer review, and to accept the entire process. So um, perhaps I, I'll keep this short because I really care that, that we have time for questions later on. Um, but I just want to also reiterate one thing. Uh, so as Ron said, uh, our major concern was really to make the peer review process more efficient not to waste reviewers time you know we all get papers to review and we review from different journals complete waste of time authors time of responding to ludicrous things uh journals time you know the number of of, of the amount of time that journals spend handling editing is you you may not be aware of that is a lot of time cost a lot of money so that was one thing the transparency is the other i that is an absolute condition of this but the quality. So um, it's actually interesting, and maybe uh, Sarah and Thomas will talk about that a little more. When I've talked to uh, people about this project, they're very puzzled about um, how to review and uh, ask this question. Well, if I don't know what's journal, what journal is this for, uh, how do I review? And in fact, what I've noticed is that some younger scientists, because they've grown up in this environment, think it is the duty of the reviewer to judge whether the paper is right for the journal for which they're reviewing. It's completely ludicrous. I mean, what does an editor do? The form, you know, I, I, don't get me going. Anyway, so I think it's, it's, it's a really good experiment for also retraining everybody to remind ourselves what the purpose of peer review is. It's to judge the quality and the veracity of the science. Um, 
And so, in fact, I think this has to be clear. We are running this as an experiment. We've got funding for a year. We will have to see how this is taken up, how other journals, how all the participating journals feel about it, how the community feels about it, and then how we're going to come up uh, with a sustainable model for this. So I think um, this is still rapidly evolving. We're constantly talking about it. Uh, we're talking about it with all our wonderful affiliate journal editors who've bought into this project. And so your feedback and your questions will actually be important and of great interest for us. Thank you so much, Maria and Ron. Uh, it's a very helpful introduction to put into context the next two talks we're going to hear. Um, in the next 15 minutes, we're going to be hearing about the mechanics and the evaluation of Review Commons. So first, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Sarah Monaco, Managing Editor for Review Commons, who will tell us about uh, how the system works. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for being here. So my name is Sarah Monaco, and I'm the Managing Editor of Review Commons. And I will tell you now uh, how Review Commons uh, uh, works. So um, Review Commons is uh, a peer review platform which runs peer review before journal submission. It was launched in December 2019 uh, as a collaboration between Embo and Asabio. It's operated by Embo Press and at the moment is uh, uh, completely free of charge for authors and, and journals because it's founded by a grant from the Helmsley uh, Trust. So, uh, um, Review Commons is a, an experimental project and uh, um, it's, it is aimed to bring some innovation into the publishing system and in particular in the peer review system. So, the traditional peer review has uh, uh, some issue as Maria and Ron has, uh, have already uh, discussed. And one of the main issue is that uh, uh, a lot of papers undergo multiple rounds of reviews. So, they are really reviewed independently many times at many journals, uh, leading to a huge way of time for the researchers. Another problem is that the reviewers do not only evaluate the science but also a journal fit leading to an escalation of requests that uh, are not focused on the scientific content of, of a manuscript but to satisfy specific criteria of a journal and uh, uh, also despite there are now many efforts to improve the transparency of peer review uh, many journals uh, still do not uh, uh, report uh, the, uh, the reviewers publicly. So Review Commons is aimed to overcome these issues and in particular uh, the main goal of Review Commons is to improve the efficiency of the peer review system by avoiding serial re-review cycles, to focus the peer review process exclusively on science and to improve the transparency of peer-reviewed uh, research. But let's see how Review Commons works. So the two main features of Review Commons are uh, uh, a journal independent peer review and a consortium including 17 different journals. At Review Commons, we receive manuscripts in form of direct submission or as a preprint. Uh, we do have an initial editorial selection that we do in consultation with our advisory board. At the manuscript, uh, the manuscripts that pass this selection are assigned to uh, a reviewing editor who belongs to the EMBO Press team, uh, who runs the peer review and is in charge of finding the appropriate reviewers. Uh, the reviewers uh, are specifically asked from us uh, to uh, only evaluate the science in, in a manuscript, uh, regardless from any possible journal fit. When we receive the reviews back, uh, we simply send them to the authors without making any decision. And uh, the authors have, the, uh, have the, uh, the possibility to trigger the posting of uh, the manuscript plus the reviews plus the responses on BioArchive, uh, giving rise to what we call a refereed preprint. Uh, a refereed preprint is like the first outcome that you can have in, in Review Commons. This is also independent from, uh, from, from publication. And through the refereed preprint, uh, you can have your, uh, your manuscript posted on my archive with the reviews, giving it immediately more credibility. Uh, the authors can, of course, uh, also submit the same document to uh, one of our journals. And if the first journal uh, decides to not accept the paper, uh, the, um, the, the authors have the possibility to submit it immediately to a second journal with the same set of reviews using the same system. And they can do that up to four, time, four times in the system of Review Commons. And when the paper is finally published in one of the journals, it is published along with the, the reviews. So 
um, uh, in order to achieve the goal to improve uh, uh, the efficiency of the peer review, we have eliminated this need of serial re-review cycles. And this is possible because all participating journals uh, agreed to use our, possible, our portable reviews without starting the process uh, from scratch. Um, to achieve the goal to focus the peer review process only on science, we have implemented a journal independent review uh, for which we give clear instructions uh, to, the, to the reviewers and that makes the reviews portable, so more transferable between different journals because they are not meant to satisfy the specific criteria of a journal. And to improve the transparency of peer-reviewed research, we have the refereed preprint, which are a great way to disseminate peer-reviewed science, so solid science, uh, immediately before uh, waiting the long times of uh, publications. Uh, the scope of Review Commons is very broad. It virtually covers uh, uh, all uh, different fields of cellular and molecular biology. And you can see here in this box uh, um, some uh, of the topics that belong to our scope. Um, we only uh, consider reviews or commentaries and uh, we sent out for peer reviews all the manuscripts which represent a significant advance in the field and this includes new findings but also methods and resources. Uh, the Review Commons editorial team is composed by myself, uh, by Thomas Lemberger that you will hear very soon, and uh, uh, Shirin Nightline, who is our editorial assistant. Uh, we also have uh, uh, on board the Embo Press editors, and we are very lucky to have them. Uh, so the manuscripts are assigned to them according to their field of expertise, and this was very important for us because uh, uh, through the, their established network of trusted uh, reviewers of, of EMBO Press, we could offer immediately uh, to the others very high quality peer review in, in our platform. Uh, as I said, we also have an advisory board, an academic advisory board, who is composed by um, uh, young group leaders that are very involved in the project, in the project and who are providing us advices uh, to decide uh, whether to send out uh, uh, a manuscript to, to peer review. So to be very transparent about our uh, criteria, uh, this is uh, uh, um, what we ask our board in, in the consultation. So we ask first if the study is, uh, what is the value of the study in the field of, of research? What is the significance and the advance in the field compared to the existing literature? So what is the novelty? And what is the likelihood of finding uh, experts in the field that are uh, willing to review uh, the manuscript? So I have to say that this consultation so far worked uh, really well and we send out for peer review around 70% of the manuscript that were submitted to Review Commons. So the journal independent review is one of the main features of Review Commons, but this is still a concept that is, uh, is new for, uh, for reviewers. So to help them to articulate a, a reviews that are really journal independent, we have created very detailed uh, guidelines, uh, which, uh, um, I mean, uh, the, the, these reviews include, uh, include two parts. So the evidence, reproducibility and clarity, and the significance. In the first part, which is like the most technical part, we ask the reviewers to evaluate the paper as it is and not as it should become to fit a certain journal level and to, uh, to comment on uh, how convincing the conclusions are and to suggest new experiments only if they are necessary and uh, realistic. Uh, the significance part is also very important because it helps to put the, the, the findings of a manuscript into a broader context and this is very useful for the receiving editors uh, of the journals to, uh, to understand whether uh, a manuscript could be suitable for their, uh, for their journal. So after our authors receive our beautiful peer review, uh, journal independent peer review, they have the choice to submit to different journals and this is the screen that they find in front of them. So you can see that uh, the journal belonging to our consortium uh, um, are part of different uh, uh, publishing groups, including EMBO, uh, eLife, uh, PLOS, uh, Company of Biologists, and also uh, JCB and uh, uh, MBOC. Um, and collectively, they cover a very broad scope and they have different acceptance criteria. So uh, we are confident that with, with this broad array of 
of journals that we have in our group, uh, all the manuscripts that are reviewed by Review Commons uh, uh, will find a home, for, uh, for uh, an appropriate home for, uh, for the manuscript. So, as I said before, one of the main outcome of Review Commons is this refereed preprint, and we strongly believe in, in the value of refereed preprints. This is a big, big opportunity for the authors to share uh, their scientific finding with the scientific community immediately and with credibility, because this is how the refereed preprint look like. So here there is the article, and here there is this uh, uh, blue widget, peer review, and if you click on it, the reviews appear along with the author's responses. So this is effectively peer-reviewed science, which is available to the public uh, in, in no time. And uh, uh, this is also useful from the side of, of the authors, because since the, the manuscript is there, along with the reviews, it can also eventually be scouted by editors of uh, journals that belong to our consortium or also outside of our consortium. So we really encourage all uh, our others uh, to, to post refereed preprints. Uh, okay, so I would like to conclude now with this nice advertising poster uh, in which you see the, the workflow of Review Commons. It is downloadable from uh, our, uh, uh, from our web website. We have recently tweeted it. So if you are uh, interested in Review Commons and you want to spread the news with your colleagues, feel free to download it, hang it in your department or also uh, on social media. So uh, thank you for your attention and I give the microphone back to Jessica. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, that was very informative. Um, noticing the time, uh, I wonder if Tama Lemberger, who is the project leader of Review Commons and also um, the deputy head of scientific publications at Embo Press, uh, will be willing to tell us about the evaluation of the service, uh, but hopefully um, in something like um, a, a compressed uh, period of time, if that's possible. <laughs> thank you. I, I, can, I can try to speak. Uh... Okay, thank you. I can try to speak in French to, to go faster. So it's true, um, Review Commons was set up as, a, um, as an experiment and it is therefore important for us to stay, to, to try to find ways to evaluate that experiment to see if the experiment worked. I hope you can see um, my slides. I'm not quite sure. Can you see my slides? Yes, uh, we can see them and it changes. Okay. Hmm. Maybe I, I'm sorry, I'm wasting time because I have many windows superposed. Um, 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 <laughs> this is difficult. Whatever you were doing before looks great from <laughs> so sorry. Well, it's it's the problem is that I don't see myself my the slides. So if I would manage to otherwise we go to quit the, the pictures while you find them. So let me start again. Here we go. So we try to to find um, metrics and 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 numbers that um, <laughs> that uh, uh, qualify the, the 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 service. And our goal is, is really to reduce the cycles of a new peer review, uh, to focus the, the peer review on science, and then to increase the the transparency. We have two sources of data, which are um, the uh, the statistics, uh, statistics that we can extract from our uh, tracking systems and also that we obtain from the, the journals and then we run also a, a questionnaire survey to our authors uh, to the reviewers um, and, uh, and of course to the editors of the affiliate journals uh, now i cannot see my own slide so it will be difficult for me to comment to to say by heart the numbers but on the left you see the duration of the different steps of the, of the peer review and i think this is the first question is the peer review efficient in terms of time you say you see that it takes uh, 30 uh, 30 days um, to do the peer review we have six additional times for the board consultation and then um, the authors receive uh, the, the reviews can revise the manuscript they usually uh, take four weeks we give them four weeks, some take more time, some uh, might take less time. And then at the journal level, uh, the first decision with these reviews in hand, the first decision is fairly fast within a week. 
And then remarkably for the accepted papers, the acceptance uh, is extremely fast after 11 days uh, as, a, as a million times. So you can already gather that this fact of obtaining or an already reviewed manuscript is accelerating the process uh, on the side of the, of the journal. Now, one of our major goals is to avoid the cycles of new peer review. Does it work? And this was a huge challenge to convince the, the journals to use our reviews without starting from scratch with their own expertise and, and so on. And, and I, I plot here in, in pie charts the percentage of, of manuscripts uh, that were published or rejected without any new reviews, without any new uh, reviewers. And you see that for the, the papers we, uh, the journals have published with review comments reviews, 98% had no additional reviews. So this, this worked beautifully. For the rejected papers, the vast majority have no reviews from time to time. There's one maximal one additional review uh, that is asked for, for complementary expertise. And I think we are really, really happy about this result. It really shows that we, we could manage to convince the journals to, to play this game. Now, on the author side, I think a key uh, metric is really the time to publish. And this is difficult to calculate because it's very difficult to have access to the entire history of a manuscript. We asked the uh, authors who never published in review comments to self-report the time that they needed to, to publish a paper. You see a huge spread uh, in months uh, between five to, to 36 months, it's enormous. Um, and you, on the right, you see the, the, the time to publish within the review comment system. Uh, and, and you see that the, the time is considerably reduced. Of course, there is also a past history to review comments before review comments. This is also difficult to access, but if we imagine for a moment that the entire world will be review comments, uh, this is what we, we would achieve. Um, what is the quality of the peer review? This is a difficult uh, question. We would like to find quantitative metrics. We don't have them yet. So in, in the absence, we have asked directly our authors, what did they think about our peer review system uh, and to compare uh, review comments with the traditional journal. So the, you, you see in blue, the, the number of people who, who think that review comments was better than the journals and in red, the, the, the fraction of authors who thought that these different features of the peer review was better at the traditional journals. And, and I think it's very clear that through all these, these features, whether the peer review is less biased, whether it's constructive, transparent, uh, whether the experiments uh, requested were reasonable, uh, there is a very good acceptance of authors for, for what review comments is doing and for the quality of the peer review. Um, so um, we have now uh, papers that have been published um, across 13 of the 17 journals showing that these reviews are used by the authors, are used by the journals, they are portable across a, a broad variety of journals. 90% um, of the papers published are with transparent uh, reviews. Uh, most of the journals are, apply the transparent review process and 30% of, of the reviews were posted done by Wakav as referred preprint. We asked our authors, would you use the service again? Uh, uh, and, and the vast majority would, would reuse the service uh, um, again. And, and we, we received a lot of positive comments uh, through, through Twitter. So um, I think in, in summary, we see um, that uh, the, the, the quality of the, the peer review is well accepted by, uh, by our authors. Um, the transparency, um, we, we managed to completely abolish the, the rounds of or the, and the, the cycles of, of free review. Uh, the transparency, 90% of the papers published are, are with transparent review and we have 30% adoption rate. There is a little bit of an exclamation mark here. We would like, of course, to reach 100%. And I think this will come with time when there are more examples and when it, it will also be more apparent what are the benefits for authors, the increased visibility of posting the reviews on, on BioArchive. So the next steps is to, to extend the consortium of journals to have more journal, broader scope. Uh, it is also to make these uh, peer reviews, this uh, referee preprint uh, more usable, uh, more findable, searchable. And so we are soon going to launch uh, a platform, early evidence base, where we make it much easier to consult this referee preprint and to find them for review comments, but also uh, across a variety of peer review service, including eLive. So this is what I wanted to, to share with you. And now I give back the microphone to Jessica for the discussion. Thanks so much, Shama. 
Um, now uh, we are going to be able to hear from perspectives of, of an author, a reviewer, and an editor at one of the affiliate journals. So, um, you know, first I would just like to reintroduce uh, Kira Baba, who is assistant professor at NYU and also has used the service as an author. So, Kira, I wonder if you could tell us how specifically this differed from the typical journal review process and any other comments you'd like to share about Review Commons. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I'll try to keep this, this quick so we have enough time for, for questions and discussions. So our lab submitted two uh, papers to Review Commons. So this, is, this experience is from N equals two. Um, we thought it was an interesting experiment, so we wanted to try it. The things we noticed for ourselves was that um, the timeline was definitely faster than what we have experienced um, with traditional journal review. Um, the second thing was that the, the reviews really were focused on the science uh, and pretty much only that. And that, that was uh, kind of refreshing and, and not something I had been so used to, to seeing before. Um, the other thing that we really liked was that uh, Review Commons does also do cross reviews. So the reviewers comment on each other's reviews. And there were a, a couple of things um, where maybe one reviewer suggested one thing and another reviewer actually commented on that. And so it felt a bit more like a, a discussion. And that was actually very helpful to us um, for those papers as well. Um, and then the one thing um, that when we, we certainly will be using it again, and I think the, the one thing we, we might pay more attention to is kind of thinking ahead of time uh, what our target journal uh, would may be. And, uh, you know, especially if the work is interdisciplinary, kind of making sure that the reviewers we suggest at least kind of cover uh, disciplines according to where we might want to send uh, the paper afterwards. Um, but yeah, our review, our experience was extremely positive. Um, and that was kind of why I got in touch with Jessica as well. <laughs> Thanks so much, Vera. Um, next, I would like to ask Rita Tiwari, who is a professor at the University of Nottingham and who has reviewed for the service, how the process of reviewing for Review Commons compares to that of a typical journal, especially with this uh, kind of journal agnostic review element. Oh, Rita, I believe you're still muted. Let me uh, ask you to unmute. Uh, okay. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. So yes. yeah, I mean, uh, it has been a real pleasure to to review in the reviews comment, and I must say that I think the most important thing for me was that it was very constructive, very timely, and also. Uh, like, you know, we wanted to see a good science. And I think that was the first thing which was very crucial for me, that it is a good science, it's reproducible, and that, you know, that there is a clear message and significance in that paper. And also what I felt was that it was very constructive between the reviewers as well. So we could talk over it and it, it was not like we are suggesting experiment for one year that, and then you know, saying, okay, now you cannot be taken because you, you have to do this uh, ample number of experiments. What was there, we have to see what is the message and where they can improve the message or the experiments. And I think that was the best thing for me. And, also to see that, you know, the, we don't waste time in being both as an author and a reviewer. We don't want to waste time in uh, review, reviewing hundreds of these papers which have gone from one journal to another. Because I get sometimes papers which have been submitted to four or five journals and then, you know, you're reviewing the same paper. So in that way, it was very, very important. I think that our time, the author's time, the scientist's time, so that we could use that time more productively to do good science, rather than wasting and just reformatting 100 times and submitting to different journals. So I think it's the best way for a scientist to be productive in their science, to give good science to the audience, and to not waste time in just reformatting our papers. So I think that is the absolute thing that we should do good science, good messages to the community and not to waste our time in reformatting the papers as a scientist. So I think it's a very good thing. Thank you I so was much, very Grace. positive about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
Uh, and finally, Maureen Murphy, who is a professor at uh, the Wistar Institute and also senior editor at eLife. Um, I'd like to now invite Maureen to tell us about what it's like to handle a Review Commons paper coming through a process that is different from the standard one that you might begin with at eLife. Sure. So, um, hi everyone. So I am a senior editor at eLife in the Cancer Biology Group. Um, I want to put a pitch in for eLife. It's a fabulous journal. It's a little bit different. Um, when I get a paper from eLife as a senior editor, I first judge it for content, uh, rigor, is it interesting? And then I consult with my board of reviewing editors. Are they interested in it as well? So to begin with, there's a conversation about this. Then if we decide it is definitely worth it, it goes to review. One of the board of reviewing editors mediates that review, picks reviewers. Then there is another series of conversations between the reviewers. Do we think point two is a little bit not so important anymore? So it's a very unique journal and uh, I really, really like it. Um, when I get a paper from Review Commons, I get a paper and I do the same thing. I consult with my board of reviewing editors is, is this rigorous? Is it interesting? Is it interesting to the field? But I also get uh, the series of reviews and the names of the two reviewers, uh, and I get a revised manuscript. Now, in the past, I've gotten a revised manuscript that was clearly way better than the original one. And I have sort of the choice, should I just accept this based on um, the reviews that came in and the revisions? Um, I do have the opportunity to consult the reviewers. Do you think it was responsive to the reviews? That's an easy thing for me to do. And I do have the choice to say, um, if not, will you re-review it? So um, there's a lot of choices and a lot of options. And I've seen it go every single way. I've seen it where the, clearly to me, the revision is very important. The reviewers, the reviewers I have to say, have been phenomenal. Um, they have been very, very responsive. Um, I've seen it where the revision was clearly wonderful and the reviewers agreed and it was just accepted by eLife. I've seen it where it needed another small round of review. That's still not a waste of time. It's making the paper better. And I've also seen it where I didn't feel that the quality of the science met eLife standards and as a senior editor, I passed on it. So, um, but more often than not, I have found that the authors have been very responsive to the reviews, have done a very good job in revising, and it either was accepted right away or needed minor revision. Fantastic, thank you so much, Maureen. And thank you to all of you who have been asking a lot of thoughtful questions in the Q&A. Um, it's fantastic to see all of these great points raised. And I'd now like to hand the microphone over to Jesus. Uh, Jesus is Associate Professor at NYU, and he will be now moderating this Q&A period uh, for the rest of the hour. So thank you so much. Great. Hello, everyone. So I see that we have a lot of questions already in the Q&A uh, channel. I also have a collection of questions that you submitted before with your registration. So I'm going to go back and forth uh, between those two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, the question and I'm going to allow the panelists to self-select. There is no uh, indication uh, by, by the person who submitted the question uh, to whom they were addressing this question. Okay, so I'm going to start first with the top question in the in the Q&A channel that says, what will be the selection criteria for this initial review board? And a commentary about that is how to avoid potential selection bias towards certain topics of authors. Could you blind the editors to the authors? Could the selection be democratized? So who wants to take that question? I think that should be Thomas. We spent a lot of time thinking about that actually. I'm just barging in, but maybe the market uh, uh, summarize a so lot. Can, can, can you clarify the question again? Because um, is that from, from the selection of the reviewers or selection of no, what? Triage, triage. Oh, the, triage, triage. The, the initial, uh, the initial um, 
the initial uh, selection. Is that Correct. the question, Jesus? Uh, that's yeah, how I so, understand so, it. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so the, the initial selection, we thought a lot about it and, and ideally we would like to send out everything. Now, we, ha we are in a world of, of, of finite uh, capacity and, and resources and um, we want also to maintain a given quality of, of the paper we send out and, uh, for, to review and, and request something like between nine and 12 hours of work from, from very busy scientists. So that's the meaning of, of this initial selection, the way to implement it. We tried really to be um, as science oriented, having an academic board uh, in all the different uh, fields of, special, of, um, of speciality and ask uh, a person in the area, what is their opinion with this sort of structured approach with these three dimensions uh, that we asked to, to comment on. There is always a risk of wrong decision. There is always a risk of bias. At the end of the day, the peer review process and the publishing process is a human process. So it will never be perfect. It will never be 100% objective, but this is our pragmatic way to have a, a system that is workable, that remains, that, that maintains a high quality of, of review. And we, are, we have a lot of experience in that. And we know that the quality of the review um, uh, depends really on, on sending papers that are, are good scholarly pieces and, and, and relevant for, for, for the field. This is how we can recruit uh, our reviewers who are going to spend enough time to do a good job. It takes really a lot of time to review a paper. So we have to be mindful of the time of the people. I hope it more or less addresses the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. All right. I'm going to uh, switch to another. It's a combination of questions that were submitted with registration. Uh, this is uh, the question is what is the typical number of reviewers per manuscript and how can I become a reviewer for reviewer comments? Okay, I can answer to that. So you usually uh, try to recruit three reviewers uh, in some special cases in which it is difficult to assign reviewers. We can, um, we have two reviewers, uh, but we always make sure that- Sarah, the... you're hard to hear. Do something with your mic or get closer to it. Oh, do you hear me better? Better, yes. Then, okay. Um, so uh, we always make sure that if we have only two reviews, they are informative enough for, uh, for the journals to make a decision. So typically there are three reviewers, but sometimes two reviewers. Um, and uh, uh, how to become a, a reviewer? You can simply send an email to us and we can add your name in our, in our pool. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's possible. Perfect, thank you, Sarah. Okay, uh, this is, I guess, a philosophical question. Does duplicate peer review presume the article doesn't change and improve with each submission? Therefore, the time isn't necessarily wasted. It could be seen as rounds of peer review. And I think, uh, I think maybe Maria, you might want to answer this question. I've actually been answering lots of questions in writing and I encourage, um, Thomas and Sarah, there's some directed to you to do the same. So can, I didn't hear that question. Can you repeat it, Rizzo? Yes. Does duplicate, duplicate peer review presume the article doesn't change and improve with each submission? Therefore, the time isn't necessarily wasted. It could yes. be seen as rounds of peer review. Yes. Very, very good question. Of course, I think most of us agree that peer review does uh, improve papers. And in fact, there were also some other questions that go in the dire similar direction. I think, I think, yes, of course, if we submit a paper as an author to, to a journal and get reviews back and then submit it to the next journal, it's a better paper. And by the time we're at the third journal, it's probably a much better paper than we initially submitted and we could go back to the top journal. But um, yes, uh, peer review does do that and not all, uh, uh, not all reviewing time is wasted. Now here in this system, you also get, of course, you get uh, the receiving journal handles the revision, so it will be improved. Um, but that's the ideal where all the first round of peer review does is to uh, 
improve the paper. You still need a new set of reviewers rather than the first set going back and saying, yes, I've read it already. It's now quick to, to rejudge. So I agree, whoever asked that question, it's not absolute, um, but it is an improvement. And in the worst case, I mean, I'm sorry, I've had, I've had papers that I got from journal A um, and then got again from journal B, where my critique from journal A was met by the authors lying. So um, it doesn't always improve it. Sometimes it makes it worse. Thank you so much. Uh, another question is regarding uh, reviewer anonymity. Are, are the reviewers anonymous? Nobody volunteers, I'll do that too. Um, reviewers are anonymous to the authors. And that is a long-standing question, and some people view this as a bad part. Uh, we view it as a necessary part of honest and open peer review. Not everybody has the courage to tell people into their face, uh, you know, sometimes brutal criticism, or, you know, even if it's objective. And not all authors, it has to be said, react well to criticism. So I can forgive those who, who don't want to do that. Uh, uh, an absolutely essential point of disclosing reviewer anonymity is in the passing the reviews to the recipient journals, because a journal must know uh, who the reviewers are. They must be able to see from what corner of the universe that reviewer comes, what spectrum of science he or she represents. And of course, they have to go back to the referees to, to check uh, you know, maybe the referee wrote something stupid, then the editor may want to go back and say, are you sure about this? They may want to do the cross-refereeing uh, that both we and eLife and many others now do. So that is part of the essential part of, uh, of this uh, sharing among the affiliate journals that among the journals, the referees' names are shared, but to the reviewers, they remain anonymous. Thank you, Maria. Another popular question is how to avoid potential selection bias towards certain topics or authors? Could you blind the editors to the authors? Could the selection be democratized? Thomas? Yeah, so um, to bias for authors, uh, we, we, offer, we offer this double blind process at our journals, for example, at Embo Press. And we have observed that it's very, very rarely used by authors. Now we could we could uh, offer that also um, on um, on the side of review comments. Um, we have not yet done it because we would. It, it makes uh, usually the life of the journals a little bit more difficult. It, they have more problems to see what these authors have just published uh, last month, if it's, if it's uh, super incremental results and so on. It's not necessarily a sufficient reason not to do it. We are concerned by potential name bias, geographical biases. This is something we try to monitor. There is no magic bullet. Um, I can imagine that when review comments will be better established, um, when there will be a, an intense flow of manuscript going to the journals, we might be in a better position to introduce that at, at review comments and have it also accepted by the journals. So review comments, of course, we have to, to work with this collective of 70 journals, we, which, is, which is a little bit of a constraint and we have to make authors happy, we have to make reviewers happy, but we, we want also to make the journals happy. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, another question is regarding how to prepare the manuscript to submit for review comments. Do, do the authors have to fit into a particular format? How, how, how is that? Um, no, there are no precise requirements on, on the formatting. So um, it's, uh, it's very open. Okay. And Will other journals join review comments in the future? If so, uh, can you give us a, an insider scoop about which journals might be doing that? Ah. Look at um, <laughs> <laughs> we hope that many more journals will join and we are working on that. It's, um, we are eight months in the project. So, so you probably can, can understand we cannot say uh, anything at, at that moment. Um, I think it's important for us to expand the scope uh, there are some 
broad, big fields that we should try to to recruit, if you want. For example, biomedical oriented fields, um, certainly more neuroscience, uh, and expand. Now it's very cell and molecular biology oriented, and I think there is a lot of potential to broaden the approach um, across the entire biomedical and life science uh, fields. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, another question is about costs. If you use Review Commons and then you decide to publish in a partner open access journal, is any of the article processing charges waived? Well, no. Not for now. I mean, now, um, just to clarify, Review Commons is completely for free for authors. So it doesn't cost anything to, to authors. And by the way, it doesn't cost anything to journals. All the journals receive, if you want, uh, these papers already reviewed for free. So in principle, they, they save a lot of editorial costs because they do not have to, to run the period. Now, this is a transient uh, situation. We are funded by the Helmsley Foundation and we will have to establish a sustainable model. They will, of course, there is a cost, an enormous cost in running an operation like this. And we will have to find a, a structure of fees Several models, of course, the no brainers is a peer review fee paid by the authors. I don't know if, if this is something that we will do. Uh, there's another model, which is for every paper published with review comments, we would receive uh, some uh, recoup of, of the editorial cost by the journals. So we are looking into these models. Maybe it's going to be even a hybrid model. Um, it is still a little bit early on to, to now say too many details about. Okay. Uh is there a possibility of involving and training postdocs in, the re in reviewing papers? Will review comments be open to involve postdocs? And I guess by extension, I thought that, that this person didn't ask it, even students. Go ahead, Desa. It's yeah, really, so, well, uh, yeah, it's really, it's a big uh, idea that's not just review comments. We're thinking of that. Uh, in many ways. If you look at the editorial board, it is very young, so that's great. And um, it is clear in many uh, instances, many journals are aware of that, that postdocs assist with uh, reviewing anyway. I think many of us PIs here, uh, we train our postdocs to, to do this properly. Um, I think it would not be the first call of port, but, uh, port of call, but Thomas, maybe do you want to add what we do about that? So, so we really want to encourage young reviewers and uh, early career scientists to review. So this is very clear. Uh, to every re reviewer, we ask specifically to name the, the, the people in the lab who co-reviewed or who actually did the review such that we can uh, contact them uh, next time directly. Um, the idea of to engage postdoc is very good. I think there is no better way to train postdoc to go uh, find a uh, referee preprint in your field, uh, look at the reviews, criticize the reviews, or criticize the criticism uh, uh, written in the reviews, look how the authors have replied, and uh, really have practical exercises. I think it's a fantastic resource uh, for journal clubs and for very educated journal club to train postdoc, to do good reviews, find good examples, find bad examples, there are plenty. Uh, and this is, this is true for refereed preprint, but it is also true for all the journals who published uh, reviews next to the published papers, and essentially all the affiliates do that. So definitely, I, I would highly recommend to use uh, transparent reviews in any journal club from now on to train, you know, to have practical training in, in peer review, absolutely. I, I think we have maybe time for the last question uh, before we close up. Uh, what is the incentive structure that Review Commons plans to use to scale up? Um, so incentive for reviewers, I, I can imagine. Um, we have a, a project funded by the Wellcome Trust to, to try to, to establish standards and, and technologies that would allow to to implement some incentives for, for reviewers, especially with funders. And we would like to, to make this connection that has never been really formally done. If you peer review as a scientist, funders should know that when they evaluate your, your project, when you, they evaluate your, your CV, that should be 
part of the scientific activity that is accounted for. Uh, everybody spends all these dozens of hours so-called for free. It's not for free. It's they, they receive a salary, and 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 this is core par, um, a core activity in the scientific process uh, that should be rewarded. So so we will work with funders to establish this connection. Who reviewed? Uh, if you are a funder, we can tell you whether and, and and so on to have this communication that never really existed on a in a formal and technical way. Thank you, Thomas. So now. Uh, we are about to close. So I, I first want to thank all the panelists for an informative discussion and all the participants for their interest and questions about Review Commons. Uh, you can learn more by following at Review Commons, visiting reviewcommons.org, and you can contact uh, Review Commons directly via email at contact at reviewcommons.org. I hope you have found this uh, webinar informative and we hope to hear from you soon. Can I just say one last little thing? Because there's lots and lots of good questions in the Q&A still that could be answered. And perhaps Jessica can find a way of posting them or uh, Toma or Sarah. Yeah, because I can generate, yes, I'll export uh, them and we can answer them. All at the same time. So everybody, Jessica, will you tell them where to go, where they can find the answers? To yeah, we, so we will post a tweet at Review Commons, uh, which will have the expanded Q&A from, uh, from this webinar. And uh, perhaps we can also think about enriching some of the FAQ on, on the website. So yeah. uh, please follow us on Twitter if you haven't already. Uh, and uh, we, uh, let us know if you have any other questions there. Thank you all so much and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.